I don't know about you, but that song is so emotional for me. (laughs) You know, every day we give of ourselves to our kids. We give them everything we have so that one day they can grow up and leave our home and go make their own. Ah, that's hard when your end goal of everything that you poured yourself into is for them to go. But we want them to be self-sufficient. We want them to be confident. We want them to be Christ followers. We want them to go out and make a life of their own. And sometimes in the meantime, it means that there's really long hours, but there's really short years. The hours are long, but the years go by so fast. And through them, we give a lot of sacrifice, don't we? This last week, I uh, got to go on a field trip with my 12-year-old, her sixth grade trip to the Grand Canyon. And I was so excited about it. I thought, okay, I had all these great plans. You know when you're like a month out and everything seems possible? I thought, we're going to have matching pajamas We're going to have games for the bus, and I'm going to have snacks for all her friends, and it's going to be such a great time. Well, then two weeks before the trip comes up, life happens. And when I say life happens, it like exploded on me. Uh, The car broke down, not once, but twice, fine. Um, the, the, thus delaying the trip to Target for jammies, right? The um, doctor's visits that came up. I mean, we have a turtle who ran away. Like, what else could happen, right? No joke. We have a turtle named Max who's like this big, and he's gone. So we walked through all of this stuff, and it was like life just bombarded me. And I thought, does anybody see what I'm going through right now? I just want to go to the Grand Canyon and have matching jammies and snacks and games for the bus. But next thing I knew, it was midnight the night before the trip, and we were packing frantically, and I didn't even know if I had everything that I needed, let alone the things that I had wanted to take with us. And so we packed, and we got on the bus, and I remember as we got on the bus, just this peace came over me, like, if it's not in the suitcase, we don't need it. I could wear the same clothes for three days if I really forgot stuff. Like, it will be okay. What's most important is that I'm sitting there next to my daughter on this bus. And that was exactly where I was supposed to be, even though it was insane getting there. And if anybody finds a desert tortoise like that's like this size, let me know. But at that moment, all of that with the turtle and the cars and the doctor visits and transitions at work and all kinds of crazy things, all of that in this moment, I was exactly where I was supposed to be. And it was busy leading up to it. As moms, we are busy, aren't we? At times, we can feel like we are the glue that holds the family together. How many of you pack the backpack? And that sounds simple enough, right? You just pack the backpack. But then there's the folder that needs to be in there, the permission slip that needs to be signed, the lunch that needs to be in there, the snack that they need, and don't forget about the the past due library books that need to be in there as well. You know, there's so many things. We have to have food in the pantry. We have to have school supplies bought. We have to have, and don't forget, Friday is Julie's party, and so we need to make sure we have a present for her. And I think like three people are going to come home with us and go to that party with us. Right? That's reality. Life is really busy. But yet somehow in the midst of all that busyness, we have a very special skill. And that is that we see our kids. We see them in the midst of it. Sitting on that bus, I looked over and I saw my daughter. In the midst of all the craziness, that was such a gift. We see their struggles. We see their joy. We get to see them. We see the things that matter to them. And we also get to keep them safe. And in order to do that, we have to see ahead, don't we? There is nothing like a mom watching her toddler toddle towards a block or something on the floor that you know it's going to be face first, okay? And we are like ninjas diving over to rescue that toddler from said block and and falls on the floor and band-aids and tears and everything else. What about when you're at a restaurant? You have to be forward thinking. You have to see these children because they will pick at something under the table kind of quietly. And the next thing you know, you see it. It's going to the mouth. 
and you are like a frog going after a fly as you reach across the, the table and you grab the piece of chewing gum that they have picked out from underneath the table that they are about to put in their mouth and you take it away from them. We have to see them. We have to see when our teenager gets in the car and, and, and they get in like every normal day, but there's one sideways glance that tells us something in their day was off and that they need us. As moms, we have this unique ability to see. But sometimes I wonder as a mom, if they see me. Sometimes I wonder if, if they see me for who I am, not just what I can do for them, the lunches that I can pack, the food I can make, but if they actually see me. Sometimes I feel like that magical person behind the scenes that just gets everything done, that I know that they see the results of the things that I do, but I wonder as a, as a mom, as my heart for them, and the things that are important to me in my life, even outside of them, do they see me? And for me as a mom, as a woman, sometimes I can feel invisible. Have you ever felt invisible? Have you ever felt that no one sees you, that they see the things that you do, but that they don't actually see you? If you're a mom of young children and you're the one who magically puts everything into place and makes sure everything gets done, then there's a sacrifice involved in that. Do you ever feel that that's not seen? I think this applies to many of us. You know, growing up, maybe you had really busy parents and you thought, do you even see me? Maybe you had siblings who stole the spotlight of the family and it made you feel invisible. Maybe you have a boss who has passed you up once again for a promotion and you think, does he even see me? There's a lot of things in life that make us, can, that it can make us feel not seen. And what about when your spouse has an all-consuming job and they come home and they're exhausted and just kind of done for the day with nothing left to give. We can feel invisible. What about our children who are grown and raised and those, those children who, who once depended on us for everything that they needed? All of a sudden, they're self-sufficient and they don't need us anymore. It can make us feel invisible. What about the hours of prayer? that we've spent on our knees for a circumstance that hasn't yet changed. Do you ever feel invisible to God? I think sometimes it's fair to say that we feel invisible. You know, we all pause from time to time in different circumstances and we think, does anybody see me? And in those moments, we can feel invisible to the eyes of others. And the truth is that God sees us. And this morning, we're going to look at a story of a mother and a child in the Bible who feels unseen, who feels disregarded, who feels like they're only known for the things that they can do and not who they are. But my hope for this morning is that we're going to read that story and talk through it. And then we're going to come away with some hope and some encouragement that even when we feel invisible, that God sees us. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Genesis chapter 16. Am I the only one struggling with allergies today? <laughs> so awesome, huh? These beautiful trees are trying to kill us. <sighs> so in this story, we are going to meet a mother named Hagar. And she is running away from the household of Abram and Sarai. And here's, here's the story behind Abram and Sarai. See, God has given them a promise of a son. And not just a promise of a son, but of many descendants that they can't even count the amount of stars in the sky that will be their descendants. God has given them a big promise in this child, but that promise is a little delayed, at least in Abram and Sarai's timing. They think it's taking a little bit too long, so Sarai has this idea. Boy, don't sometimes when we wait on God, we create our own ideas. I have done this so many times. Instead of waiting a little bit longer, maybe, but something beautiful comes out of it. She says, Abram, would you lie with my maidservant, Hagar? 
And would you lie with her and maybe I can have children through her. You could say maybe she's not believing the promise of God or maybe she doesn't want to wait. But either way, this happens and Hagar becomes pregnant. And the couple refers to Hagar as their maidservant, as the Egyptian, as, their sl as the slave. And that those phrases, they don't speak to who Hagar is as a person, but the purpose that she was there to serve. But you're not defined by what you do. That's not your identity. See, they saw a maidservant. They saw a slave. They saw that she was an Egyptian. But who sees Hagar? We're about to see who sees her. Let's pick up the story in Genesis chapter 16. We're going to re start reading in verse 5. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. I understand that. That would be a rough situation. May the Lord judge between you and me. Abram says, the, the, your slave is in your hands. Abram said, do with her whatever you think is best. So then Sarai mistreated Hagar and she fled from her. So let's stop right there just for a moment. Can you imagine how Hagar would have felt? Like she may have been a little bit sassy to Sarai, okay? But then Sarai gets full permission from Abram, treat her, do what you want with her. And so she runs, she flees, she's not appreciated. I'll bet she didn't feel seen. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever feel, felt unappreciated? Have you ever felt alone, like no one understands you? That the things that you have sacrificed, the things that you have done, that they are not seen, that you are not seen. Well, sometimes we don't realize what our greatest need is until we meet the God who meets that need. And Hagar is about to meet that God. Let's continue reading in verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, son of, Hagar, son of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Let's stop right there for a moment and let's leave that passage up on the screen. There is so much in this passage. The first thing I see here is, do you notice what he called her? He called her by her name. He said, Hagar. I mean, that's beautiful. It's like saying, I know you. I see you. He says, Hagar. She doesn't say, at this time he addresses her first by her name, not slave. But then he does in the next verse, he, the next um, Word, he says, slave of Sarai. It's as if he's acknowledging, God is saying, Hagar, I see you, I know you by name, but I see the circumstance that you are in. Slave of Sarai, I see your circumstance. He addresses her in her reality. She is an Egyptian slave. She's impregnated by Abram. She's abused by Sarai, but she was a real person with real feelings and real anger and frustration and real hurts. Imagine what it would be like to just be a servant who only has to make sure that other people's needs are met. Hmm. What would that be like? But see, God doesn't dismiss her problem. He acknowledges that. He doesn't say, you're fine. That's not God. God says, I see you and I see your circumstance. And he does the same for us. And I love what he says next. Where have you come from and where are you going? Wow. Now, this is not a geographical question. This is not like I'm going from Marana to Tucson. I came from Marana and I'm going to Tucson. This is not a geographical question that God is asking her. God is asking her the condition of her heart. Now let's read her response in verse 8. I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answers. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so as much as they will be too numerous to count. Once again, there's so many gifts in those couple verses right there. First of all, I see that when you run away, God finds you. She was running away in the desert and God found her. I see that he doesn't remove her from her circumstance. He doesn't magically fix it. He doesn't say, Hagar, 
I'm gonna create a resort for you out here in the desert. Go have a spa day, get your toes done, mani-pedi, get a facial. I'm gonna remove you from your circumstance. That's not what God does here, does he? What God does here is he says, I see you. I see the circumstance that you're in. And he calls her to go back to it and submit to Sarai. That had to be hard to hear. Sometimes it's hard to hear things that we don't want to know that we need to do. But when we know that we have a God who knows us by name, who finds us even when we run, and when he knows our circumstances, and then he gives her a promise, that's a God that you can trust and you can, you can listen to. And we see in verse 10 the promise of a future. I will decrease your descendants as much as they will be too numerous to count. He's telling her to go back to her mistress, but he promises to give her a future and many descendants. It's like he's telling her, I see you in your struggle, but this is not your end. You are more than a slave. You are more than a servant. You are more than a label. Hagar, the be you are the beginning of generations to come. Wow. And that's a beautiful example that God's plans incorporate people's mistakes and difficulties. And I don't know about you, but that is really comforting to me. It is really comforting to me to know that whether I get ahead of, of God and I don't wait for my promise, and or if I, if I go out and, and other people's mistakes in my life or my difficulties, my circumstances, that God's plan incorporates people's mistakes and difficulties. And let's read on in verse 11. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He, is a, he will be a wild donkey of a man. Now let's just stop right there. You're pregnant and the Lord says to you, he will be a wild donkey of a man. What are you thinking in that moment? <laughs> That's just a really funny thing to say. So he says in verse 12, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards his brothers. He tells her to name him Ishmael. And Ishmael means God hears. God hears her. Now our kids don't always hear us, do they? Am I the only one that tends to repeat myself a lot of times? Hey, shut the back door. The one you just walked through again. The one that all the flies are coming at, shut the back door. How about, hey, can you clean your room before you go tonight? How many times do we repeat ourselves to our kids? They don't always hear us. I'll say sometimes, turn up your, turn up your ears. We're not listening. But we have a God who hears. And he's even telling her, I know, I even know about Ishmael's life. I am telling you, he is going to be a wild donkey of a man. And she's going, awesome, what does that mean? And he's saying, I know what that means. And I will be there. That gives me comfort to know he knows what my children are going to face. He will be there for him, them just as he is there for us. But what we're about to see happen in verse 13 is nothing short of pure beauty. I think this, over this past week, studying this, this has now become one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And if we're to stop right there this morning, if we didn't say anything else and we all went home, I see the God who sees me. God sees us. God hears us. She said, I see the God who sees me. That's enough to get us through the next year. That's a lot to think about. It changes our circumstances. When we are exhausted at the end of the night and we think, I cannot do anything else, and we sort of sink into our mattress, and then we hear the word, Mom. And you go, okay, all right, and we get up. When we are exhausted, God sees us. In moments where you have to make quiet decisions, that are gonna have a big impact on your children or your family, God sees you. 
when you're in the background and feel like no one sees all the things that you do as you pick up toys for the hundredth time, as you make a bed only to be lied in again, God sees you. When you're in an emotional wilderness and you're wanting to run away, God sees you. See, she wasn't looking for him. She was running away. And some of you here this morning, you're not looking for him either. But I want to tell you that he will never stop looking for you. We have a God who pursues us. He found her. Perhaps you find yourself running away from hard things in life. Life can get really hard. But I will tell you that the God of the universe runs after you. He sees you. She was running away. God saw her, understood her trial, and met her in her suffering, just as he does for us. She names him El Rai, the God who sees. Now, there are over 900 names and titles in the Bible that have been given to God to show his character. And, you know, we can easily, you know, we look at this and we think, you know, El Rai, the God who sees. But it goes more than physically seeing. It goes more than what he sees with his eyes. It's it's almost like he's, it's an acting upon what he sees. He sees you and he acts upon what he sees. It's much more than seeing. See, Hagar made it personal when she said, you are the God who sees me. And it's much more than just an awareness of us. El Rai implies that God knows the circumstances of our hearts. He knows the things that got us to where. He knows where we've come from and he knows where we are going. He knows the truth about every situation in our lives. And he shows himself as the one who wants to be known by us and also the one that wants to be known. He sees us. We're never alone. We are protected. We are loved. He sees us and he hears us. And sometimes it's in our greatest needs that we realize this. Our our needs help us to experience the character of God because it's in our time of need that we experience him in the deepest of ways. And I know that this is true for me. You know, the time when, when things are going great and I'm on happy, happy land and I'm just going along because things in life are rocking pretty smooth. When that happens, do you know what? Things are good. I don't always lean in the way that I could. But when things get hard, I'll tell you that's when I lean in. I always have this picture in my head of of when God's yelling, like when God's talking really loud to me, I go, yeah, hey, over there. But when he starts to whisper, when he starts to whisper in my time of greatest need, when he whispers, I lean in to hear what he has to say. So when we feel like we are at a time of our greatest need, it is then that we get to see the greatest character of God displayed. Hagar may have felt invisible, insignificant, but she was actually a very significant part of God's story. And not for what she does, but for who she is. See, Hagar has the longest conversation in the Old Testament with God. If you look back, she has the longest conversation with God of men and women. So she has this long conversation with God where God shows up for her. And she calls him El Rai. And if you look at over those 900 names for God and the character and the titles that we have for him, El Shaddai, all of those, Elohim, all of those, you will see listed El Rai. Looks like El Roy. And that is Hagar. She is the only one in the Bible to call him the God who sees. I think there's something beautiful that we can learn from Hagar. She meets a personal God. She says, I see a God who sees me and who acts upon what he sees. And she captures that significance of her encounter with God by naming him El Rai. And that truth is displayed all through scripture. We see the God who sees displayed through the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament and all throughout it. One of my favorite places is Psalm 32, 8. And it says, I will instruct you and teach you 
in the way you should go, and I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Isn't that beautiful? He sees you with eyes of love. And sometimes, depending on seasons in my life, I know that if somebody would have said, God sees you, I would have thought, oh no, hide. <laughs> it might not have been a good time to be seen. But he's not seeing us in that manner. He's seeing us to say, I see you. I will act upon it. I will be with you in the moments. I see you. He sees us with his eyes of love. He will guide us with his eyes. But how more amazing is it if we look back? I see the God who sees me as he guides us with his loving eyes and we turn back and we glance back at him. How much more amazing is that? And I don't know about you, but for me, this truth changes everything for me. When it feels like no one sees what you do every day, all of the mundane tasks that are in, day in and day out, you know, the laundry, the dishes, the toys being picked up for the 17th time, the endless bickering. I don't know about you, but I have two people that live in my house that I have never even met or seen. Yet they cause a lot of fights, they make a lot of mess, and they break pretty much anything that's important to me. And their names are wasn't me and didn't do it. Do you guys have the, the do they live at your house too? wasn't me and doesn't do it. They do so much around my house. And the endless bickering that I have to, you know, figure out every day of, you know, well, who did do it? And I don't even care who did it. Just stop yelling at each other, you know? In those moments when you feel like no one sees what you do every day, you keep these little people alive. And sometimes it takes everything we've got, friends. Sometimes it takes everything we have just to keep our patience. <laughs> And you wonder if anyone sees what you do in the shadows. Well, God sees you. And we may not get our reward from our little people saying, thank you for keeping me alive today. Or thank you for feeding me for the 17th time. Or we might not get that from them right now. But God sees us and our reward is in him. This changes everything. What happens when someone insults you? What happens when they belittle you? What happens when they tell you how to parent your children? What happens when somebody attacks your children in some way? This changes everything because we can be assured that he saw that conversation because God hears, God sees, he knows about that conversation. We don't have to come unhinged. We don't have to be defenses, de defensive. We don't even have to set that person straight even though everything in us wants to, especially if you come after our babies, huh? But we don't have to do that because God hears, God sees. That changes everything. What about when you're at the grocery store and your child is flipping out because you did not buy the right box of cereal and it is not in the cart and they want it and you're saying no and now they are on the floor kicking and screaming and the first thing we do is look around to see who's watching, right? We look around to see, do I know these people? Are they from work? Where, who are they? Um, or if you're like me, your kids will only flip out when there's people from church around. <laughs> um, but you're in the grocery store and you're wondering, oh, they're seeing me. But guess what? God sees you in that moment too. But you know, instead of glaring or a judgmental glance, he is cheering you on, mamas. Know that this changes everything. What do you do when you feel like you're in over your head? Like there are challenges going on that, that are bigger than you are and they are before you. You don't feel prepared. You don't feel qualified. You don't feel like you have enough time. You don't feel like you are enough to handle these challenges. Well, I want you to know that God sees you. And the glory of God is best demonstrated in our lives when we don't feel like we have enough or we don't feel like we are enough. See, with El Rai, if you've ever been left out, had your opinions not listened to, if you've ever felt alone, if you've ever been in a desert, he hears you, he sees you, he hears your cries, he sees you, and he acts upon what he sees. When Hagar says, I have seen the one who sees me, I believe that is an invitation. Do you see what he sees? 
And I'm not talking about physically, but I'm talking about do you see what he sees in you? Do you see the potential that he has put in you? Do you see the gift that is uniquely you? The things that God has put inside. What is unique about how God, how the way, the way that God created you? What is unique about that? Each one of us sit in this room completely unique and completely different from each other. So what if we see ourselves the way he does? What if we look for the right inside of ourselves instead of the wrong? What if we stop criticizing ourselves and we say, God, show us how you see us? What if we see the value that he's placed in us? I have a fun fact for you this morning. Did you know that there is gold in your body right now? As you sit here this morning, there is real gold that is flowing through your veins. And about a 150-pound person, there's 0.22 of a milligram of gold that is actually in your body. And it's concentrated in our blood, but it tends to kind of stay around the heart in the highest concentration because obviously that's where our blood gets pumped out of. But see, there is gold that is actually in your body that God has put there. And so today, I'm going to put out a challenge for all of us. Okay, it's a two-part challenge, all right? You're like, it's Mother's Day. There's no jobs to do. This is a good one, I promise. I want to challenge you to be a gold prospector. Do not confuse that, please, with gold digger. (laughs) I've been waiting all morning to say that. (laughs) Um, I want to challenge us to be gold prospectors, to look for the gold in yourself. It's there. God has put it inside of you. There are things that only uniquely you can bring to the world today. So let's be gold prospectors. Let's look for the gold inside yourself. Let's stop in the busyness in our lives and actually see the gold that God has put in us. Because if we start seeing the value in us instead of our faults, we're also going to start seeing the value and the gold in others. So here's your challenge. Challenge number one of two, okay? Number one, tomorrow morning is Monday, the wonderful Monday, right? And you're going to get out of bed, right, like you always do, or you wouldn't be here. You're going to put your feet on the ground, and you're going to walk at some point to the bathroom. And you might be putting your hair up in a messy bun to take your kids to school. You might be getting fancy because you're going into the office. You might be just brushing your teeth because it's your day off, and you're just going to sit and enjoy coffee for a little while. But at some point, you're going to see your reflection in the mirror. And when you do, I want you to pause for a second. All of us will have this moment at some point tomorrow morning. And I want to ask you to do this. I want to ask you to say, God, would you allow me to see myself through your eyes? Would you allow me to see myself the way you see me? His eyes are loving And you were created with value and a purpose. And may we see the gold that he has placed in us. May you see the gold that he has placed in you. Because see, when we see ourselves the way God sees us, we can only help but see others around us in the same way. And that brings us to challenge number two. Okay? So challenge number one, you are a gold prospector. Just know that. First, we're going to find the gold in ourselves. We're going to ask God to reveal that to us. What does he want us to know? What is uniquely you that only you can bring to the world today? The second thing to the woman, the mom in your life, even your husband, your kids, tell them something specific that you see in them. Call out the gold in them. Tell them something specific about themselves. Now, when my kids are fighting and I say, say something nice to each other, they're like, you're nice, you're good at spelling, I like you. Not like that, all right? So something really specific that'll hit home. Something like, you know, mom, I haven't always listened when you've told me this, but I see the benefits of it. You know, grandma, you have so much wisdom. And I I remember when you told me this, I actually remembered that in my life. Let's go and call out the gold in those around us. You know, when you see a friend And you can say, hey, you know what? I just want to tell you in case no one else tells you today that your kids are awesome and that you are doing a great job. Call out the gold. If that mama and that child is laying on the ground in front of the cereal aisle, walk by and tell her you're doing a great job. 
It's in that moment she will see, she will feel seen by you, and she will feel encouraged and cheered on. And moms, we don't always feel that our kids see us. But I want to tell you and encourage you that they do. When I went to the Grand Canyon with my daughter, on my way home, we were sitting in the bus, and I was actually kind of revving up, thinking, okay, the vacation's over, it's time to go back to life, and, and I still have a missing turtle, and my car is still on the fritz, and we have all this stuff still going on, right? And my daughter leans over to me and goes, hey, Mom, I know you have a lot going on. Thanks for coming with me. And it was so simple, and I almost lost it on her. <laughs> Because I thought, you saw it, you saw. And, and I don't want her to see all the sacrifices. I mean, that's okay if she does, you know. But that's like not what I want her to focus on. Because what I want her to focus on is that I did it for her. Of all the gold she could have pulled out in, from me in that moment, mom, thanks for coming with me. Ah, oh, she saw I put her first. And maybe because I complained a little, she might have seen some of the sacrifices that I made to get there. But that's okay. So mamas, I want to encourage you that they do see you. The last thing, where are you coming from and where are you going? What is it that has shaped you and made you and brought you to where you are today? And what does God want to do with those circumstances? Because our circumstances change, but what is constant is that we have a God who sees us, who hears us, who knows us, and who pursues us. And that, friends, changes everything. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you so much for the message of Hagar, God. God, I thank you that you are a God who sees. And I thank you that we are known by you, Lord, that you know our names, that you know our circumstances. And God, I just ask that this week, Lord, that you would help us to see ourselves through your eyes through your loving eyes. You are a God that we can trust. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for how you pursue us, how you hear us, and how you see us, Lord. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.